Um, my father is, was Vietnamese, and I grew up during the time of the war. Uh, Sister Jewel mentioned that yesterday. It's interesting. In Europe, it's, or in the US, it's called the Vietnam War, but in Vietnam, it's called the American War. Growing up in this time, uh, although I was not so directly affected personally, uh, uh, because my father was a diplomat, so we were traveling. I was not all the time in, in Vietnam during the war, but still, obviously, my family was directly affected. My family comes from central Vietnam, and so uh, the, the family was as many families, especially in central Vietnam, but all over Vietnam, was split in two. Uh, so part of uh, my family went north, and part of my family went south. So the family was split. And uh, I grew up with a very strong uh, awareness of the reality of war. And, you know, I'm, I'm afraid you don't see much over there, but it's one of the very famous pictures of the Vietnam War, a, a uh, village has been just bombed with napalm and the children are running away from the burning huts uh, in fear and terror. So these are the kind of pictures that, you know, that were sort of very deeply moving at that time. Uh, and so uh, this, you know, the, I, I was very moved by uh, trying to understand what was happening. And... Uh, uh, it was also, for many young people of this generation, the political awakening uh, in the US, but also in Europe and in many other countries, uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s, uh, the, the political awakening and the feeling that the, the, the way the world had evolved, uh, leading in so many wars and conflicts, there was something wrong with it. Uh, and in 1968, uh, I was in Paris. Uh, I was just finishing high school, and uh, the elders amongst you remember that 1968 was the year of the revolution almost everywhere. So I was in Paris, and although my father was actually working for the South Vietnamese government, I was personally siding with the North Vietnamese, or with the Viet Cong. So we, in, within our close family, there was sort of a, you see, because uh, having experienced uh, life in the West very closely, I was not impressed with it. And, and actually, I was hoping that uh, you know, communism or socialism would be a viable alternative to what I was experiencing as not working. And then having been in Paris and having experienced uh, you know, like police violence and so on, uh, it, it strengthened this kind of political engagement. But... Uh, uh, at that time, uh, I already knew Lisi, my, she's still my wife, she's sitting here. And while I was in Paris, uh, she was in Prague, you see. And in Prague, it was the other way around, <laughs> right? The young people were also hoping for freedom and, and, and more, you know, opening up of the society. And then they had the Russian tanks coming in and uh, Prague, uh, summer of, in, 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 the, in the summer when the Russian army invaded Prague. So, so it, uh, that was a very sort of a puzzling tension. You know? We students in France or in Europe, or even in the US, you know, hoping that socialism or communism might be the solution to the problems that we were perceiving in, our, in the environment we were in. And then students are really brother, sister students in Czechoslovakia and other similar countries also aspiring to another world and being, you know, uh, run down even more violently than we were in, in Paris uh, by the Russian army. So that really led me, that was a sort, first sort of awakening and also questioning. So if it's neither the one nor the other, so what is it? What is it? Is there a third way? Is there an, an alternative? And uh, in this time, uh, it was uh, uh, shortly before that, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the uh, Vietnamese Zen master, uh, came to the U.S. and, and toured the U.S. together with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I was just in the U.S. a few days ago, and I spoke uh, with a gentleman my age who had been very involved in the campaign of Martin Luther King and who had been very close to Martin Luther King and was there when these uh, meetings were happening. He was a... a he had been a marine surgeon or army surgeon, marine from the marine, 
and you know had uh, then uh, uh, reacted against the Vietnam War and then had uh, joined the civil rights movement in the U.S. And he told me that actually the meeting between Martin Luther King and Thich Nhat Hanh had been pivotal in also in Martin Luther King's uh, trajectory to include the peace and the, the, the anti-Vietnam War movement in his civil rights campaign, which in, it was not there in the beginning. In the beginning, it was really civil rights for the, for the African Americans and the minorities in, in the US. And with the meeting with uh, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the awareness of the reality of the suffering of the people in Vietnam sort of came as a, a new dimension that was then intimately united with this movement. And, um, and I, I believe that for uh, Thich Nhat Hanh meeting, with, uh, who had been already advocating uh, um, uh, socially engaged Buddhism in Vietnam, the meeting with Martin Luther King and seeing what Martin Luther King had been able to, to, to move, right, to, to, to this ex extraordinary kind of, of dy uh, dynamic uh, was also a very inspiring. So it was, I believe, a very mutually inspiring encounter. And so uh, that is maybe the first spark. Uh, although in these days, I didn't know that, right? In, in 68, I, I wasn't aware of it. Although I obviously knew uh, about Martin Luther King and uh, Thich Nhat Hanh had been my f family's teacher back in Vietnam, but I didn't know him and uh, I was not aware of him. But he, my uncles and cousins and so on, um, we are his students. But somehow I see the seed, you see, of, of what has been then the red thread through my, through my life, uh, dating back through these events, the experience of the Vietnam War, the experience of uh, the May 68 student revolution and the disillusion about the possibility to change society by revolution and, and violence and then you know, all the terrorism that, that followed. I, I mean, not the recent, the then, you know, like uh, in Germany, in Italy, in France, you know, the, the students who then turned violent and so on. And uh, then at the same time, uh, Lisi experiencing sort of the reverse, but the same, it being in Prague as an Austrian. Prague was just next door and she was going there constantly. She had so many friends there and she was helping them to flee from Czechoslovakia as the border very briefly opened uh, during a, sh a short time, just as the Russian came in, the, Rus the borders opened and quite a few people uh, went out of, of Czechoslovakia and Lisi was, uh, you know, she, she was a young teenager, but she was very so <laughs> active. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think that that was really the starting point of this sort of the reflection that has led my life ever since, which was really about what could really bring a sustainable and structural deep social change. And the, the, what uh, started to become more and more clear right after Paris, then I, I went, uh, I was meant to go back to Vietnam. Uh, but then it was the situation was so 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 violent, so difficult. Uh, my father advised me not to go. I was with him. Then we got the news from the family, and it was you know after the Tet Offensive, it was very very violent in Vietnam. And I was in age of to 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 go to the military. I was turning 18, and uh, you know uh, I would have been uh, drafted uh, in the South Vietnamese Army because my father was South Vietnamese. And so that was out of question for me to join the South Vietnamese army. So I didn't go to Vietnam and I, I was in Thailand with my father and we didn't cross and I went back and, and I went to uh, India and Nepal. And there I met my first teacher who was actually a, a Tibetan uh, Lama. And with him I, I learned, uh, I had my first uh, lessons in meditation. And, I, and so although I come from a Buddhist family, this sort of Buddhist background was not so, so present in me. I had been a lot in the West and went through French education, and so it was very secular. Our family was very secular. My father was sort of Buddhist, but uh, you know, just nominal, not really practicing, or, and we didn't, I didn't know much about it. And so the discovery of, 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 of Buddhism, or the rediscovery of Buddhism, was a very important moment. And for a, a short while, I considered maybe I should completely focus on that and maybe uh, you know, go in a monastery or you know, in... in, in the Tibetan tradition, you have these three years, three months, three days retreat. So I thought maybe I should do that, do a long retreat and really transform myself and so on. But on the other hand, 
I had been really involved in political action and social action and it, it felt difficult for me to completely give this up and only yes, retire in a monastery or something like that. And then I had a girlfriend in, <laughs> in Europe <laughs> and that was sort of an incentive to go back, <laughs> which it really was because you see, <laughs> we're still together. So that's what, uh, 40 something years ago. So, so that was the other incentive. So I didn't become a monk, obviously I still have my hair. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and so Lissy and I really, uh, from there on, strived from, from all, through, all through our life to, to think about how can we really bring together these two aspects, inner transformation, shift in consciousness, and social change, social innovation. So that was really the red thread. And because we had both been sort of disillusioned with the political action that had really led nowhere at that time, and for us at least, uh, so we thought maybe we should try it on a small scale so that if, if we can do it in a, in a small scale then, w then one can see if it's possible to, to scale it up so to say yeah? but rather than you know have big ideas and not do much let's try it out and so we really lived all our, uh, all our uh, family or all our married life in communities uh, and, in, um, and in one community in particular we lived like 20 something years uh, and uh, it was a real attempt, a bit like a Schumacher College, you could say, you know, a real attempt to live in a different way. For instance, we didn't have a salary. Or, you know, we worked and the money that came in went into a, a common sort of uh, fund and then the redistribution was based on dialogue and not at all on the rank or level of, you know, like diplomas or it was not because you were a doctor that you got more than if you were a gardener or a teacher or whatever. It was really according to the needs of the families or of the individuals and not. So it was a relatively radical way to deal with money. And we did it for many, many years and it worked really well. And you know, we have children and they went through school and to a university and everything was possible. So it was a very interesting experience to notice that uh, it is feasible. It is feasible to uh, deal with the economic system in a very different way, although in a very small scale. Yeah, we were like, what, 100 people or give or take 100 people in this community. Where was that? In Switzerland, in Switzerland. yeah, near Geneva Lake. Very beautiful property overlooking the lake. And it was a part of the Camp Hill movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, inspired by Rolf Steiner's ideas and, and anthroposophy and uh, uh, we had uh, uh, young people, uh, teenagers with uh, disability living with us in, the, in our family, um, uh, mostly uh, young people with autism and, and together with our family, our children and so on and so forth. So that was a, a very interesting experiment and a, a very interesting sort of effort to uh, even if it's a very small scale, to try to l live uh, in a way that is aligned with the sort of aspiration that we had. We had a biodynamic farm, you know, had our own bread, our own milk, uh, you know. Uh, so, so it was also a very nice surrounding for our kids to grow up. Uh, our kids grew up there in, in this sort of, there was lots of kids living together, you know, we had like 15, 20 kids, more or less the same age roaming free in this big park and so so it was a quite an interesting experiment and we did it for for quite a long time uh, but then you know the, there was this sort of uh, tendency uh, to to align with more mainstream kind of uh, uh, rules and regulation and you know the states paying but then asking for uh, certain you know uh, alignment with state regulation like uh, uh, how do you call that, uh, uh, work hours, you know. Until there, we never accounted. We didn't make a difference. Is it work or is it private life? It was just life, you know. <laughs> but then suddenly we had to have time sheets and, and then, you know, we, uh, then, then actually it didn't work that the salary go in one pot because what about pension and this and that. And so, so when these things sort of started happening, I was not, we were not really interested anymore because that was not what we were looking for. We were looking for... <laughs> A, an opportunity to try to experiment in a real life, although in a small scale, a different way to, to, to live together, to have a social 
uh, uh, fabric that is based on something else than mainstream economic and political and uh, administrative uh, structures. And, and also I felt in a way I had sort of experimented what I could and it could not really go any further. That was about you know, what we could do. Uh, it was a very strong learning experience. Uh, you know, Sister Jewel, for those of you who heard her talk yesterday evening, spoke about the learning experience of community life, and that's also what we experimented. Yes, you had this very uh, nice uh, picture of it's like when you have uh, uh, shop sticks and you rub them together to clean them, you know, when you, ha you have a community and you have many shop sticks and you put all the shop sticks in water and then you rub them like that, then it cleans them, but it's Sort of, it, it's, it rubs, <laughs> right? So community life, I really like this picture because I really recognize that, you know. You rub against one another and it's not always comfortable, not always, but you know, you get rid of certain things, you know. It, it's sort of a catharsis process, you know. Uh, community life is an interesting catharsis process. So uh, we did that for quite a while and at the same time, uh, you know, the, the war had ended in 1975 in Vietnam and Lissy and I started going back to Vietnam very early uh, because of my family there, we were able to come, go back long before it was open for foreigners or, or even for Vietnamese who lived abroad, who came back very much later. We had the opportunity to go there uh, because one of my uncles was um, uh, an official in the, North Vietnamese, or in the Vietnamese government because it was now united. And because we had worked with children living with disability in the West, we started doing the same thing in Vietnam. And uh, as you probably know, at least uh, the seniors among you remember that uh, one of the huge problem in Vietnam had been the use of Agent Orange. Yes, this very toxic defoliant based on dioxin that was sprayed over the Vietnamese jungle, uh, like 50 million tons of dioxin. Uh, spread over Vietnam, and the consequence was an Im immensely high rate of uh, very, very severe disabilities among the children, uh, especially if the mothers had been exposed to Agent Orange, and of course, so many of them had been exposed because it's very indiscriminate. You, you know, it's like, uh, like, uh, you know, like in the US when you have this plane that's spraying the fields, mm -hmm. so it's the same, but it's not spraying uh, uh, pesticide, it's spraying uh, uh, Agent Orange. So it's just completely indiscriminate. It's just vast, vast uh, portions of land had been, has been sprayed. And so um, uh, my uncle, one of my uncles, who was actually at that time uh, ambassador of Vietnam to U the UN in Geneva, came to visit us. We were near Geneva and saw what we were doing. He said, why don't you come and do that in Vietnam? We really need it. So we started doing that uh, very early in the 80s in Vietnam, working with the children and developing a community, uh, not exactly like a Campil community like in Europe, but really based on Vietnamese culture and values and, 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 and context, but trying to recreate this kind of uh, community context and uh, alternative life form, which was interested, is, uh, interesting and still is, it's still very alive and we go there uh, every year, tr several times. Lissy spends more time in Vietnam than I do because I'm in Bhutan. But w what is really interesting is that we uh, have the possibility, and that's sort of the blessing of the people with disability. We spoke in our group of the voice of the voiceless, you see. And uh, I think that's a very good example. The voiceless have a speci specific power. Yeah? So they are the weakest about the weak, right? They're the, like, Children are weak anyway. Disabled children are weaker than other children. And, and they're from poor families. So they're really, you know, like the weakest among the weakest and they have absolutely no voice. But when we can tap in their energy, then things can happen that cannot happen without them. So when the voiceless get a voice, something very magical happens. And uh, we could, through them, find an a, a doorway into Vietnam that would have been unthinkable. At that time, there was not a single NGO working in Vietnam, not a single uh, foreign aids organization working in Vietnam. It was totally closed. But because we were working with this chil these children, it opened the door for us. And, the, and, and until now, we have always been able to do things that 
normally is not possible, like buying land, uh, you know, it's a communist country, you don't buy land, and, and having a private organization, there's no private organization in Vietnam, everything is state-run and so on. So that's, I think, a very interesting dimension, how the, this weakness becomes a specific strength. <laughs> you see, something that is, is bringing something, like a, a opening a space almost of grace, you see, almost of blessing. So we did that, and then when I left, uh, uh, we decided to move on, and then I joined the International Committee of the Red Cross. And uh, joining the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross is the part of the Red Cross that works in war zones and conflict areas. So this is Afghanistan, uh, this is also Afghanistan, that was pictures I took in Mazar -e Sharif, northern Afghanistan. Uh, so I spent quite a lot of time in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Darfur, Palestine, and so on and so forth. And so after having been living in a very sort of almost secluded, almost monastery-like context yeah, for a long time, 20 years or something, almost like in a monastery, suddenly I was like thrown out in the, in the world stage, you know, the places that usually you only see in TV or you read about in the newspaper. Suddenly I was there. And that was a very, very interesting experience. Uh, of course, meaningful, because if you feel that you can you know, alleviate some suffering and bring some help, it's always something that is meaningful. Also very hard, because there was really a lot of violence uh, and a lot of suffering to be witnessed. Uh, and this is Darfur. Darfur was one, I think it was the first, uh, the first field, field mission that I did was in Darfur during really the the worst of the Darfur uh, crisis. And uh, uh, having been in a number of crises uh, and, and conflict areas and war zones, uh, a, I had a very uh, strong experience. You know, in the preamble of the Constitution of the UNESCO, it's written, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. It's a nice phrase, but frankly, I had never really understood it. Intellectually, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah. But it, I didn't really experience what it meant, right? What it really means, until I experienced it in myself. And I would like to share with you this moment where it's sort of, and it was a very specific moment. Uh, part of the work we do in the International Committee of the Red Cross is visiting war prisoners, right? The Geneva Convention allow the Red Cross to visit prisons. And uh, so the f the I, I, was, uh, um, I was the head of the learning and development at the Red Cross, so I was training the young people, the young delegates that we were sending to the war zones. And of course, I had to accompany them to see whether the training that we were providing uh, really was supporting them to do the difficult work they had to do. Most of them had never been before in a war zone. Of course, we had local staff who had grown, had grown up there, and were, but we had a lot of expatriate staff because you could not, uh, for instance, prison visits have to be done by people who have a neutral nationality, not being part of the conflict. You could not send neither Palestinian nor an Israeli in a Palestinian or an Israeli prison, obviously. So we had like young Swiss or French or Canadians or whoever who had, never, who had grown up in a very sort of peaceful, sec secure environment and suddenly found themselves in war zones. So how do you prepare them and how do you support them to experience that? So I was uh, doing prison, visit, uh, vi prison visits with some young delegates one day and uh, I had spent the whole morning visiting prisoners. It was a military prison where the people who had been arrested uh, uh, were put before they were on trial. And sometimes it went months and months and months, some, even years. They were just in these prisons and the trial never came. Oftentimes the family didn't know whether they were dead or in prison. So very, very uh, dramatic situation. The youngest were like 14, 15, the eldest were 70 or 80, you know, and, and packed in, in those small uh, cells. And, and then you had the young soldiers with their uniform and their machine guns, you know, uh, shouting at the prisoners and so on. So, and as a, a, a Red Cross delegate, you are allowed to have interview w without witness. That's part of the Geneva Convention. You are allowed to have a, an interview with the, with the detainees without anybody else in the room so they can speak frankly. 
so we had this interview without witness, and so you hear very, very hard stories. Be people have, you know, people have been mistreated. People have experienced very, really heartbreaking experiences. There's a lot of suffering, uh, physical, psychological, health, and so on. So you hear one story after the other the whole morning, you know, one story after the other. And after a while, it's sort of you have the feeling the cup is full. How do you, you know, how are you? So once in a while, we took turn and go out in the, in the courtyard and, you know, and rest for a while, drink a tea and, you know, and be in the sun. No, in the shade. It was very hot, you know, in the sun. In the shade and, and, you know, sort of, and it smells very, very bad in prison cells. The smell is horrible, you know. You have so many men, you know, together, sweaty and so on. You know, it's very hot. Of course, there's nothing, you know, very little available, uh, so sanitary uh, and so on. <coughs> So I, I was there, and then a young soldier came up to me. Uniform, machine gun, you know, strong, fit, and started talking with me. And I felt uh, a, a kind of very strong antipathy. You know, I really felt like, you know, I'd seen these soldiers shouting with the prisoner, and, you know, and I felt a very strong antipathy. I was like, ugh, I don't want to speak with this guy. You know, really, I was very reluctant to speak with him. And um, then at one point he, uh, he continued. And I was surprised. You know, he, my body language was very clear. It was, you know, <laughs> shut up and go away. But he continued. He continued speaking. And he wanted to create a contact. And that was, I was sort of reluctant. And then he started telling me, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing my uh, military obligations. But, you know, back home uh, in, my, in, in my community, actually I work with young people and I would like to do, when I uh, finish with the military, I would like to study a social worker and do something with it. And then suddenly, you know, it was sort of a mismatch, you know. And, and, but it was really hard for me to overcome this kind of negative feeling, you know, like... You know, it's, it's so easy to side with those you perceive to be the victims. But it's not easy to have compassion with the, the one you perceive as being the perpetrator. It's very, it's, it takes a lot. And I realized, you know, and then at one point he looked at me and he asked me, do you think I'm evil? And I was so shocked, you know. I felt so ashamed. It was, a, it was like, you know, I was, I, I realized, you know, here I am. I was in my, I don't know, late 40s or something like that, early 50s. I'd been practicing meditation and spiritual path since I'm like 18, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, meditating every day, very like... <laughs> and in the real life, you know, I meet a young man, younger than my own son. And I'm not able to look through the uniform and the machine gun and see the human being also suffering. Also a victim, you know. And then I realized, aha, that's what it is, was beginning the mind of man. It had begun in my mind. Suddenly I saw the war in my mind. As long as I thought the war is in their mind, <laughs> I didn't really understand it. Because then you think, yeah, you have to somehow make sure that these people who are very violent become less violent or something like that. But no, I had, suddenly I saw I'm a humanitarian worker, I'm a peace-loving man, I've never, you know, shot a, uh, carried a weapon in my life, whatever, you know. But the war was in my head, in my heart. I was so discriminating, you know, against this person. And it, it, was, it was a very strong uh, uh, wake-up moment for me. And uh, it completely changed my way of working in the in the Red Cross, and uh, it reminded me of a very well-known poem by my teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. I don't want to read the whole of it, but a few lines that I, maybe many of you know. It's called Call Me By My True Names. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh wrote it uh, in the late 70s when the boat people were fleeing Vietnam, 
And, uh, you know, there were all these atrocities. The pirates were hijacking the boats, killing the people, raping the women. And he had heard that a little girl, 12-year-old girl, had been raped by pirates and then had thrown herself in the, in the ocean and had drowned. And he described, so at first he felt so much compassion for this little girl and actually anger against this pirate who did something so horrible, you know. And then, but when he meditated deeper, he saw that's, that's too easy, that's not the way it works. And then he wrote this poem where he says, Don't say that I will depart tomorrow, even today I'm still arriving. Look deeply, every second I am arriving. To be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding in itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am a mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am a frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond, and I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the, gra on the frog. I am the child in Africa, all skins and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks, and I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Africa. I am the 12-year-old girl, refugee on a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate, and I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. And it ends, My joy is like spring so warm, it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true name, so I can hear all my cries and laughter at once so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true name so I can wake up and the door of my heart could be left open, the door of compassion. So that was really the wake-up moment for me in my work in the RCRC, uh, where I realized if I cannot at least start to feel like that, I am the prisoner and I am the guard. I am the, the refugee and I am the soldier. That I, actually I could not work in this field. So that was a, a very uh, uh, strong uh, wake, uh, wake up moment. And the second wake up moment was uh, connected with the realization that what I was witnessing was physical violence. But behind this physical violence, there was structural violence that the physical violence was just this, the, the tip of the iceberg, but the systemic structural violence of the society as the system itself was never addressed by the work we were doing. We were coming after, too late, once the, 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 the conflict had already flared, once the refugee were running away, once the people were getting, get, were getting slaughtered, but what was behind it on structural violence that just flared up was not addressed. And I think that is really what led me to go to uh, Bhutan, you know, that I had seen too much of that part of the violence, you know, the soldiers, the army, the guns, the, and I realized this is not where change can come about. It's in the, the underlying violence, structural violence. And uh, being in, 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 in war zones, uh, you know, one realizes one aspect of the war that is never really spoken about is the structure of nature. When you see a, a, a battlefield, it's t totally destroyed. And of course, one thinks of the suffering of the people, which is fair enough, because they do suffer. But all the other beings also suffer. The plants and the animals and the nature itself is completely burned and destroyed. And this is just, you know, like a, uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg of the way we are destroying the planet altogether. So the battlefield is just sort of a, a metaphor, you see? There it becomes obvious because everything's burned. Yeah? But actually, when you, we see you know, this 
this curve of the way we are uh, you know, abusing uh, the resources of the planet, the planet itself has become the battlefield, not just the battlefield, the local battlefield. So that was one realization, yeah, that actually this violence that we are doing to the earth appears very clearly in the battlefield, but is there much beyond the battlefield, actually everywhere. And the other violence that for me was so evident because you know, I was in Darfur in feeding centers where you have these children that arrive that are uh, only skin and bones. You know, there's, the mothers have no milk because they are underfed themselves. They have nothing to feed their children and the children are just skin and bones. You cannot even feed them. You have to you know, feed them through the veins because they cannot swallow and so on and so forth. And you have these mothers completely despaired. You know, with, and again, that's just the tip of the iceberg because that's happening you know, on a very wide scale, that actually a tiny proportion of, of humanity is, is misusing and misusing the vast majority of the resources. And you see, like this is 20% of the world's riches consuming, give or take, 80%, and the 20% poorest consuming 1.5% of the global, uh, you know, uh, what is available. So, so this kind of... That's the other, another kind of violence, yeah, structural violence. And again, in a feeding center in Darfur, it, it just jumps into your face. But it's, it's everywhere, with, even within rich societies. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, this kind of scene, I've seen too much of it. You know, and after a while, you say, you know, what can you do? You know, in, in this feeding center, it was really dramatic because you know, the, in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, um, be allowed to be fed, then the child has to be under a certain body mass index, BMI, so-called, yeah, body mass index. So if it's below a certain body mass index, then the children uh, qualify, so to say, for a feeding program. And once they're above, then not anymore, because it's too many children to feed. Look at Syria now, for instance. You have two million refugees. How can you feed? You know, uh, from the two million refugees, there's maybe, I don't know, six, seven, seven, eight hundred thousand children, you know. And from these, maybe uh, two, three hundred thousand are babies. So how can you feed that? We're not al able to. So we have this feeding center and they have to have a certain, be below a certain body mass index, you know. And then uh, when you come back a few months later, I, you know, I was uh, again training the people working there. I was asking the nurses, so... Uh, is it uh, is it uh, is there progress? And she said, No, no. The the, the 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 same mother keeps coming back. And I said, Why is that? And then we inquired, and the mother said, You know, I have six children at home. You give me food for one, but I have to share it. You know, I, I cannot feed one child and 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 uh, you know let five starve. So I have to share it. So of course the child doesn't cannot gain weight. Yeah. So then the solution. Uh, was okay. Then we will. When we feed a child, we feed the whole family. Mm. Seemed to be a good solution. So it worked for a while, and then again it was not working. And why was it not working? Well, because to qualify for feeding program, you ha must be below a certain body mass index. So the only way for the mother to be able to feed her children is that she has to starve one, mm. so that at least one is under the body mass index. So she gets the food, then she can distribute to her children. So you know, this is the kind of real life situation of, of many, many in this world. So, and, and, but that's again the tip of the iceberg. That's you know, where it really hits you in the head because it's unbearable. But the violence is much broader and these kids are also victims. You know? Not only this one is a victim, this one is also a victim. So this is the kind of world we have created, yes, this kind of, of polarities. So, after having experienced that, I thought, okay, for quite a number of years, I was thinking, I was almost by the end of my career, I thought, no, maybe I will slow down and retire or something. But I was still, you know, I really had this feeling, but what, what can we do on a deeper level to change the, really, the structural violence, the systemic violence? And uh, that led me to uh, meet with... Uh, Gross National Happiness and ultimately to uh, join the Gross National Happiness Center. 
And it all started with the fourth king of Bhutan uh, having this sort of intuition or inspiration, I don't know, as a very young man when he said gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. And uh, in the 70s when he said that, that was an idea that didn't really ring a bell much. In the meantime, it has changed because we have a lot of data that shows, for instance, that there's no correlation between the growth of GDP and the life satisfaction. This is USA between mid-50s until the 2010, the GDP has grown tremendously, tremendously, but the life satisfaction has remained stagnant. And you can add data over data, you find that everywhere, that beyond a very, you know, as soon as the basic needs are met, which is f uh, at country level, give or take $15,000 per year, per, 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 per capita. Above that, there is no more correlation between the growth of the GDP and the satisfaction, uh, happiness, well-being of the population. Yeah? So, so this disconnection and this sort of fixation on, 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 on gross domestic product, uh, although we now have all the data that shows that it actually brings hardly any uh, um, any uh, um, increase in well-being and happiness and uh, life satisfaction uh, and it's at the cost of the destruction of the environment, at the cost of social fabric, at the cost of culture, at the cost of uh, inequality of equality and so on. So uh, that was really this kind of reflection that led me to uh, want to in any way I could, even if very modest, to support the work of the Gross National Happiness Center. So now you had a, uh, quite a long, a bit heavy, bit uh, <laughs> presentation. So you can look at a little uh, animation film, which is a bit lighter, uh, describing what is Gross National Happiness. And I can take a little rest. <laughs> this is the fourth Dragon King of Bhutan, a beautiful country at the eastern end of the Himalayas. He became king at the age of 17 in 1972. It was then when he had to decide what should be the philosophy behind his reign. He looked at other countries and noticed in most of them, the government and the people strive for economical wealth. And those few who achieve this goal usually live a comfortable life. But on the downside, many other people live in misery, poverty, or social isolation. Also in the ruthless hunt for money, huge parts of the environment are often destroyed. This couldn't be the right path for Bhutan. The concept of gross national happiness was born. The primary idea of GNH is that every human being aspires for happiness, and a country's development should also be measured in its citizens' happiness. The fourth Dragon King's challenge, therefore, was figuring out how to balance economic development with the emotional and spiritual well-being of his people. Although economical growth can be the only goal, a flourishing economy gives the government the funds needed to provide a working health and educational system, as well as certain living standards. Because being healthy, having opportunities for the future, and knowing that security, a steady income, housing, or well-balanced time use are guaranteed is crucial for people to be happy. But furthermore, people get a lot of positive energy from being with others and sharing interests. Participating in cultural life and to hold up local traditions and cultural heritage lead to a stronger community feeling. Healthy family relationships Advocating community activities and religious aspects are factors for achieving happiness. It gives the Bhutanese people a strong sense of values and identity. The fourth Dragon King reigned 34 years basing his decisions on all factors of gross national happiness, asking himself, what makes Bhutan's people happy? And the fourth Dragon King lived by example leading a very simple life. In fact, 
He believed so strongly in the concept of GNH, he even decided to hand over sovereignty to the people. In 2006, he retired as king at the age of 52 and changed the course of history. Two years later, in 2008, Bhutan elected its first representative parliament. Since then, the idea of gross national happiness has taken quite some momentum outside of Bhutan with other countries and people around the world thinking about adopting the GNH approach to strive for development with values and to make the world a happier place. <laughs> so on the lighter side. <laughs> and uh, now let's hear from the Prime Minister of Bhutan. Gross national happiness is the philosophy that had guided Bhutan's and development process for about now 40 years. It is based on the belief that development must serve a purpose. That development's role is not simply to promote continuous and limitless economic growth, which is what GDP or the conventional economic models tend to do. And that again, in within a finite environment, within a finite world. There are bounds within which growth can take place. Natural, social, resources and so forth. And so GNH is based on the belief that uh, development must be human-centered and that its objective must be to create those conditions that will enable the human individual to achieve what is most important to him. And that happens to be happiness. And then again, happiness, we believe, is a condition that can be attained when one is able to balance the needs of the body with those of the mind, the physical and the mental needs being balanced. And likewise, the uh, balance between the spiritual needs of the human individual and the material needs. And so it is a human-centered, holistic, sustainable, and uh, inclusive development approach. Now more and more people who are dissatisfied with the result of pursuing an economic development uh, that is no longer seen to be sustainable, they are seeing GNA as an alternative development paradigm. Okay, I think we will end it here because I see that my time is up so that we still have time for uh, question and answers.